so good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever you are, people who are tuning in. So I'll be talking about my work under Dr. Sindora for the last three months. And it's as titled, Comparing Biosignature Search Missions via Bayesian Inference. So before we move on, let's take some time to enjoy a very nice quote by Carl Sagan. He says that we are star stuff which has taken its destiny into its own hands. And that could not be truer. Like we are made of these inanimate molecules and they all come together from consciousness forms a sentient being. And now we are so evolved that we are probably taking a leap into the future. We are going to the next level by searching for biosignatures for exoplanetary life. And maybe one day we'll visit them too. So yeah, this just provides me a lot of motivation to continue with my work. And so I'll start. So future missions that detect exoplanetary biosignatures would require best results given a fixed level of investment. And for that, we need to make very robust predictions through statistics or probability. And what better than based here? So it's like this ubiquitous tool, which is useful everywhere when we're trying to make predictions, when we're trying to understand distributions. So I'll be using that. I'll be using certain statistical methods to compare different missions, and especially to compare galactic habitability hypotheses. And at the very end, I will also show some cost-benefit trade-offs. So before I begin, it's not nice to not share the motivation for my work. So, but before that, I'll share a brief table of contents so that everyone just keeps up with what I'm doing. So at the very beginning, I'll talk about prior distribution of exoplanet biosignatures. And after that, I'll look at data sets, not really data sets because we don't have data that much, but I look like if we have some data, how would we understand about the population parameters of the variables? And eventually you'll understand why we, are, why we are talking about beta distributions or their ratio. And using several methods, we can actually use them to check ga galactic habitability hypotheses, to make predictions about different missions and what kind of investment to make if we have two different competing missions. So yeah, uh, the very beginning is that biosignatures is something which is either present or not under my assumptions. So if something is either present or not, and you have a collection of them, they follow a binomial distribution. It's the same as the number of heads in n tosses. So it's the same as that, it's either heads or tails. And then we use this ubiquitous tool, Bayes' theorem, which gives us the probability of our hypotheses given data, given the data given hypotheses prior distribution, oh, sorry, posterior distribution. So this is my conjugate prior, and this one, the posterior, is a binomial distribution. And after we get the conjugate prior distribution, we can infer from that. That's a very well-known thing in statistics that the conjugate prior of a binomial is a beta distribution with some parameters n plus one and capital N minus small n plus one. So what are these exactly? These do have a meaning. Small n means the number of detected biosignatures in the population and capital means the total number of exoplanets in the patch of the night sky that we're serving. So like all probability distributions, this is a density function, which is given by this. So this beta function is basically like a binomial coefficient. So it's more or less like a binomial, it's just not directly like a binomial distribution. So what do we do if we have some data that we get from this binomial distribution, sorry, the beta distribution? So let's first look at what we can write the beta distribution as. So we can kind of write the parameters in a neat format. But then again, for a beta distribution, we would loosely require that small n is greater than zero, which means the number of detected biosignatures is greater than zero. And I think Fermi paradox just pours in here very nicely because it says that, well, if we haven't observed anything, then maybe there is nothing out there. But yeah, my analysis says that there has to be at least one out there, albeit it's loosely required, but still. So anyways, if we have some data set, say x equals x1 to xn, then we can easily estimate small n and capital N minus small n using something called the method of moments. And adding these two, we can get an estimate for the total number of exoplanets in our survey patch, which goes as the average minus the square average divided by the variance of our data. But here's a small problem that we face. Now here am I plotting the estimate of n versus my average given different values of the variance. And you can clearly see that for variance is greater than 0 0.25, the estimate of n is negative. That's a nonsense estimate. How do we get a negative n? 
And that is an issue. That is an issue with method of performance. Often things lie outside the parameter space. And you might say, well, let's do something else. But method of performance is indeed one of the most used things in statistics. And that's because it's simple to use and it yields consistent estimators. So by consistent, I mean that if you take a large amount of sample, if the sample size goes larger and larger and larger to infinity, then eventually it will converge to your actual value. But those are the advantages of method of moments. There are certain disadvantages. For example, you may get a nonsense output like a negative n, or you can get biased estimators, which are not really that important in this context, but it's still nice to know. So once we have applied my method of moments and seen that there are some stuff that are happening and some are going wrong, what's the next step? Well, method of moments can work on standard beta distributions, but in reality, there are some more issues. Firstly, the sample sizes are pretty low because we can't access a lot of exoplanets. And secondly, we don't even know how many exoplanets are there in the night sky. So it's like, if you're trying to find out the number of adolescents who spend more than five hours on their mobile phones per day. So you, will you go and pick up random people on the street who look like adolescents to you? You probably won't. You just ask your friends and family. So that's what we are doing. We are doing something called convenience sampling. We are only sampling from those that we already know. And same goes for exoplanets because we don't even know how many are there. So for convenience sampling, you can kind of understand that we are only sampling from one part of the distribution. So the rest is unknown. There might be some bias. But so what we can do is we can just take two samples from the distribution we know and try to compare them. And by comparing them, we can kind of try to get rid of the bias that we had. We can't get rid of it completely, but we can. So the worst kind of bias is something which is called a scale bias, which actually amplifies the bias that we have. So we can eliminate it by just taking a ratio of the distributions. So therefore we get a quotient beta distribution which has basically the parameters small m, small capital M, small n and capital N from two different beta distributions. Now this has a PDF as well, but it, um, it's very complicated. It's really complicated. So we'll just look at the plot. So here is the density function of the quotient beta. In the first case, we have m equals one, and these are like randomly chosen. It doesn't really matter. And in the second case, we have m equals three. So if m equals one, we get like a polar distribution and m equals greater than one, in fact, we get kind of a unimodal but asymmetric distribution. One of the nicest things to see is while the ratio of the distributions can like assume any particular value from zero to infinity, we see that they are more or less concentrated near the zero. So that means that much of our life, which was going to be hard has now been made easy because we don't have to look at very large f's and we can only consider very small f's. So moving on, we want to use method of moments on this quotient beta distribution to estimate what kind of parameters, population parameters, in particular, small n, small n, capital n, capital n would be. But we don't want to use it on general distributions because they will give rise to second order polynomial equations in three variables and solving them is a nightmare. So what I'll do is I'll cleverly tie up the galactic habitability hypothesis, which says that, well, there's a strip in the Milky Way where there are, where it's, hot to be habitable. So we might find exoplanets with life there. So if two missions look for distributions in the galactic habitable zone, then we would expect that those distributions are same, which means a small n equals small n and capital N equals capital N. And then we do get two estimates, which are still kind of complicated looking, but once you get data, you can actually work them out and you can get a good enough estimate. So if you want a more visual look at how the galactic habitability zone looks, um, it can be seen here. So this is the Milky Way. This is our sun right here. And this patch is theoretically called to be a galactic habitable zone. There are some criticisms of that, but yeah, we can go on with that. So how do we actually make sure that our hypothesis is correct or not? What we can do is we uh, can use method of moments to estimate small m capital N, which are equal to small m and capital N. And we can do this many times, compile many estimates. So if the estimates are all close by, then we can with certain confidence say that, well, the hypothesis is true. It's true for the entire zone. But if it doesn't, if there's a large variability between the different estimates we make, then we have to be more skeptic about our theory or our hypotheses and maybe try to debunk it one way or the other. And similarly, we can also look at other stuff such as dependence of the biosignature on the star metallicity, the presence of active galactic nuclei and so on. 
the last part that I was working on was specially introducing quotient beta distributions and variances on that to understand competing missions. So if we have a quotient beta distribution, we can calculate the variance of a random variable. So variance goes like this. We cannot really make a direct analysis looking at this, but very soon I'll introduce a plot, which will be pretty interesting to look at. So suppose we have two different cost models. One of them estimates capital N and the other capital M. So to survey capital N planets with a root yield of capital N naught, we would need C raised to Q, where C is my cost fraction and Q is just some exponent. And same goes for M, but since N and M are competing, hence if one of them takes C to the Q, the other one will take one minus C to the Q. And these two are my two different cost models that we have, or the same cost model, two different cost equations that we have. And what I'll try to do is I'll try minimize the variance. Let me show that once again, this variance right here with respect to the cost. So I'll just write these in terms of cost and these in terms of uh, fractions. So FM and FM, we consider them to be constant because they do not really depend on our cost. They are predetermined actually. So after minimizing the variance, we get an approximate value of the cost as this fraction where S equals N0 by M0, F2 by F1 times one minus F2 by F1 by one minus F2. So this might not look very intuitive right down, but we can do a quick sanity check. So if my FM and FN are same and N0 and M0 are same, which means we are using same root yields to look at the same distribution, then we actually derive C equals half, which means that you, you are expected to spend equally on both the missions. And I think that's a good enough check when we have equal emissions and equal distributions and you want them to be distributed equally. Okay, so finally, what I do is uh, check that I considered FM and FN to be constants when minimizing the variance. And now I'll take all possible values of them from zero to one and I'll plot how the minimum variance changes with change in these parameters, these predetermined population parameters. So you can see a very nice heat plot. Uh, you can see that these are on loft scale to make things look better. But one of the interesting things that we see is that there's a straight line down here, which is probably a contour, which says that FM equals FM. And you can see as long as FM equals FM, then our variance is more or less staying constant. And that's pretty interesting. And as we see that as, as it is queuing, like FN is going bigger with respect to FM, then we get a lower variance, which is actually good. And if FM is going bigger with respect to FM, we're getting a higher variance, which is bad. And you might ask why, and that's because of the intrinsic ratio of beta distribution, which puts one at the bottom and another at the top. So there is kind of a bias introduced with that. So I'm working with N by M. You could have worked with N, M by M and got the exact opposite. But the most important part here is the middle ridge, which says that these are like linear distributed. So here are the two points. So we can see that same opposite fraction under the oh, same root. Just so you're aware, you're, approximately... you're over on time right now. So please do try to finish in the next minute if you can. Yep, yep. So same opposite fraction under the same root is the same, same approximate output. And good observed fraction of n is a more dominant determiner of mean variance. So this is it. And you actually need to spend on missions because if you cannot spend on missions, then you're broke. But yeah, I thought I'd be telling about more about my confusion side, but technically you can just get back to me and I can give you these slides. So yeah, that's all the talks that I have. And thank you all for giving me this chance to speak. Wonderful, great job, Soham. We have enough time for one question if there is one amongst the audience. It'll have to be a little quick. I see one hand going up from Sanjoy. So um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I guess I'm still trying to grasp what is the, I guess, what is your conclusion? What can we say about galactic habitable zone now based on your biogen study that we could not before? Yeah, the, so the point is that uh, we were talking about galactic hypotheses and many criticisms that were of the hypothesis was mainly looking at different factors, different physics factors, interstellar dust and gas, how they react with different solar systems. But this is more of a statistical thing. So my model generally predicts that if there are future missions and they bring back data. So given one mission's data, we can make a better prediction for how the exoplanet distributions look like and how the other missions, the next missions, would actually try to probe their surrounding regions. So if say we have like one or two missions that bring back data which show very bad estimates of the galactic habitability zone, 
then we would know that future missions would not take that in mind and look for regions which we thought were equal. So they would like go over the entire place, crowns the entire place and make predictions. Thank you. So it's a formalism to improve your prior for each new yes. prediction. So we just get more informative over time. Fantastic. Great job, Soham.